we'll begin. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, It's Difficult, Listening to Mothers of Adult Children with Mental Health Challenges. I am delighted to welcome Judith Smith, a mother, psychotherapist, clinical social worker, researcher, and professor at Fordham University. Judith leads research into the experience of women as they age, and her new book, Difficult, Mothering Challenging Adult Children Through Conflict and Change, describes the challenges of later stages of motherhood and was just released earlier this year and now available for audiences everywhere. This webinar marks the launch of our brand new logo um, for education and support to our caregivers, which we have called the birds. We acknowledge and honor the invaluable role that the birds play in fostering wellness in those they care for. So we look forward to connecting with and bringing you more research as um, we expand our program called the birds. So thank you so much Judith for being with us and bringing these resources to life. Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, I look forward to meeting you. We're gonna have questions at the end. Um, and I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about my research and my book. Um, I spent the first part of my career studying young children and studying child development between the mother and child. And as I got older, I became a gerontologist and I became interested in the older mother-child relationship or with adult children. Um, so I became really curious that what was written about mothering in later life and what, how were mother, mothers affected by their adult children's problems? I'm sure all of you have been, when we used to go to bookstores, have been to bookstores and looked at the parenting shelves and there's you know, hundreds of books of parents of infants and toddlers, some more of parents and adolescents. Then it gets to about you know, two or three books about uh, parents of adult children. And then uh, when we start looking at mothers specifically, and then mothers of adult children with serious mental illness, we get to really hardly anything. If you do a quick search for mothers and mental illness, often you're gonna find mothers who have mental illness, not mothers who are caring for their kids with mental illness. So I'm also an academic. So when I look at the academic research about this issue, um, basically when the professionals write about and research who's caring for people who have bipolar disease, uh, the word caregivers comes up. And caregiver is defined as family or partners or friends and that these caregivers take on the responsibility of helping the person with bipolar cope with symptoms of depression, mania, high suicide risk. And the research shows over and over again that caregivers' physical health and mental health suffer. However, when I did my research and I, was, I talked to over 50 moms who had what I later called difficult adult children, none of them refer to themselves as caregivers. I don't know, I mean, it's interesting that the Bipolar Foundation's now gonna <clears throat> call caregivers birds or how you think of yourselves, but the women I talked to call themselves mothers. They were doing what they were doing because they were moms. Um, obviously, I do know that uh, fathers who have adult children who have uh, mental illness are certainly affected by their kids' lives. But when I was doing my first wave of my research project, it was a qualitative project, could only be a small sample. And so for simplicity, I started just with moms. But I also theoretically didn't believe that the word caregiving, it's supposed to be a gender neutral term. But if you look at the statistics, 70 to 80 to 90% of caregivers are women, whether it's with spouses or with adult kids or with one's adult parents. So when I began my research, um, I actually went to senior centers, I went to union halls, I was looking for women over 60, and I wanted to find about, out about their kids' problems in later life and how they were affecting them as mothers. But I didn't wanna go in and say, hello, tell me about you know, all your kids' problems, because there would be no trust. So what I did is I saw everybody two times, and in the first interview, I asked them, to tell me what it was like to be a mother of, let's say Susie, when she was a baby, what was the pregnancy like? What was it like when they first went to school? Were there any problems? What were the high points? What were the low points? 
What about when they became an adolescent? They started dating. What were the issues that the mom remembered? And sitting with me for an hour and a half, and I'm also a mom, we could laugh and cry about, you know, some of the very normal parts of parenting a child. And then the second time we met, we talked about the things that were difficult. So um, Jillian, I met when she was 76. And what she told me is, she says, I feel like I'm a mule being held back by a harness. And the harness I found out was her commitment to providing shelter and safety to her daughter, Celia, who had her first psychiatric break at age 22. The next 20 years in Jillian's life were framed by finding and refinding new apartments for her daughter. Uh, Jillian and her husband had resources. They were both professional people and they could afford and made the decision once their daughter had her first break to house her in an apartment nearby their home so that they were not together 24 hours. This was unusual. Most, many of the people I interviewed did not have those resources. And if their child needed to come back home, they often had to live with the parents. But even though Celia had these resources, it didn't buy her peace. Celia had to move, uh, Jillian had to move Celia 21 times in 20 years. She would set up an apartment, it would all be great. And within six to nine months, Celia's mental health uh, would reemerge in the form of paranoia, which triggered anxiety, fights with neighbors, recklessness, and the apartment she would have to leave, the apartment either be destroyed or the landlord say she had to go. Her friends witnessed this over and over again and felt, what is she doing? Why does she keep doing the same thing over and over again? And Jillian said to me, she would tell her friends, look, Celia needs to eat. She needs a place to live. I'm her mother. So she was basically say, I'm her mother. This is my obligation as her mother. Now, family obligations are critical for our society. We depend on families to take care of each other. And it's basically assumed, I mean, cultures can vary in terms of how much independence one is expected to have from one's family or how much uh, you are expected to stay connected. But all families provide intermittent support when there's a crisis, if they're able to. When an adult child has their first baby, if somebody becomes ill, if there's a divorce, the family steps in. I mean, this is what a mother or a father does is we're there in a crisis. But what happens when the crisis is longstanding? What is it like for a parent? What do we know from other people's experience about what it's like to be a mother when the crisis becomes the long-term uh, trajectory of the adult child's life and the mom's life. So I'm gonna tell you about Hope and Samantha. Um, so we met, she was an artist. Um, Hope had heard me on the radio and wanted to be part of my study. She was 63 when um, I interviewed her. And she was telling me about her early life with her daughter. She said there was always something. It was the suicide attempt. It was the stealing with the credit card. It was not going to classes when she was enrolled in Mass Bay Community College. These were like the big events. Then there was the sex with the boy in the attic. A lot of events that I felt personally hurt by. And I realized that the hurt that she was telling me she felt by her daughter's doing these different things that she hadn't expected is what each time she had to see her daughter in a new light. She wasn't, at the same time, Samantha was, she told me, a very smart, very social. She was always invited to people's houses. Um, but each of these events that I just, she just told me, made her mother realize that not only was she smart and social, she was also troubled and at times was dishonest. So when Hope was, um, when Hope's daughter was about 15 and had the suicide attempt, she found a therapist. The daughter was uh, not seriously ill. She did not have to be hospitalized. She found a therapist for her daughter. And after six months, the therapist called the mom and said, 
I just want to let you know that Samantha's not speaking in the sessions. She just spends the hour looking at her phone. So the mother was obviously exasperated, both at her daughter and at the therapist. But life went on and her daughter became 22 years old and um, she had been living with a boyfriend and then told the mom she wanted to come stay with her and things were fine. And suddenly the mom realizes there was things that were missing. Her gold coins that she kept in a special cabinet that had been her parents had been stolen. And she realized the only person who could have stolen these things was her own daughter. She confronted Samantha and Samantha very openly said yes and told her mom, look, I'm, I'm taking crack, I'm addicted and I needed the money. Her mother was both horrified. She knew she had had drug issues. She didn't realize they were this uh, substantial. Uh, she, the mom got on the phone, made all the right phone calls to find a treatment center that would take a 22 year old. But they all told her, your daughter's 22, she has to be the one to make the call. Her daughter had no interest in going into a drug-free program and uh, Hope was felt powerless. She didn't know what she could do. She couldn't force her daughter to go. But what she did do, and to her own amazement, looking back, as she said, you can't live here. I can't be here with you when you're stealing from me. So uh, they had a good relationship and uh, Samantha at that point worked with her mom to find some place where she could go. There was a homeless shelter that would take her. Um, she was expected to be drug free, but she wouldn't be monitored in the way she would be in a drug treatment center. And she stayed there for nine months and they stayed in contact with each other. And then uh, she left the homeless shelter, uh, met a young man, Three of them uh, set up an apartment and things were really quite good, fairly stable. Um, but Hope told me that she continued to have worries even when her daughter was doing relatively well. Um, she was worried whether her daughter was a food delivery person. Um, and she worried, because many times they didn't have enough money, they would have their electricity almost turned off. And the mom was able to step in, give the money. And Hope was worried because she knew she was going to retire in three years. Who was, how was she going to step in when she was living on a fixed income? But what was hardest for the mom was realizing that she was holding on to unexpect, unrealistic expectations for their relationship. She, the mom had started attending Al-Anon because she knew her daughter had a serious drug problem and she wanted to talk with other parents. She found it very reassuring to hear other people's stories. But what she was told, and if any of you have ever been to an Al-Anon meeting is, if you don't expect anything, you won't be disappointed. So we'll, this refers usually to don't expect that your daughter or son as an addict will recover. Hope was telling me that she applied it to her own hopes for a more reciprocal relationship between herself and her daughter. And this was not happening. So she told me a long story about one day her daughter called her from work and said, I'm getting off early. I'd like to come up and visit you. The mom was thrilled. She started cooking her daughter's favorite dinner, vegetarian lasagna, got everything ready. She's about to go to the train station to pick her up. She called just to find out if she was on time, if the train was on time and finds out her daughter hasn't left the house yet. So now we're talking about an hour and a half delay. The mom said, okay, but she didn't say don't bother coming. Um, anyway, one hour, two hour, three hours delays. The mom ends up going to the train station. The daughter's not there. So it was just some sense of, um, this was not working out. And finally, through the many phone calls back and forth as she's on the train, the mom realizes that really Samantha is coming up because she needs money. She needs $75. And she gets off the train, the mom hands her the money and says, don't call me anymore and puts her back on the train. They did speak two weeks later, it was the daughter's birthday. But what hope talked about in terms of herself is my daughter doesn't know what it's like to have to make it work, to not get on the wrong train, to call when you're not able to leave on time, 
To me, these are just normal things. And to her, I still don't know why she wouldn't call beforehand and say, listen, it's really late. Let's make another plan or something. It would have definitely taken the edge off for me. So Hope really described that she said, I feel trapped in this relationship that I'm not willing to give up. And unlike a divorce where you can really give this person up, I just really don't feel able to give my daughter up. So on the one hand, Hope recognized that her daughter had serious problems that led to her being late. But at the same time, Hope believed that she blamed herself that she was the problem, that the mom herself was the problem because she too quickly responded to her daughter's requests and offers to visit. And she always had her hopes up that somehow this was gonna work out. But here again, like on the multiple missed pickup at the train station, it was always, it was disappointing and frustrating. So after listening to, as a qualitative researcher, what you do is you do open-ended uh, interviews, and then you do transcripts of the interviews, and then you read them over and over and begin to see if there are themes that are emerging. And what I started hearing was, you know, the women I interviewed, some were poor, some were affluent, many were middle class. They all had many differences in their lives. Some were still married, many were divorced or widowed, but there were commonalities. Each of the women had opened their houses to their adult child when the child had no place else to go. So one thing you should know that to be in my study, the adult child had to have left some period of time. So they had to have been independent enough to uh, move out. But the difficulties occurred when things happened in the adult child's life that they could no longer work, they could no longer live with the girlfriend or boyfriend and had no place to live and no place, no way to support themselves and turn to the family. Many, I didn't know what I would find when I started my research project. I didn't know what, when my question was, what problems in adult children's lives impact you as an older person? And what I discovered was the people who chose to speak with me, many of their children had mental health problems or substance use disorder or both. And none of the women had expected their own later years to be framed by being a parent. But there were also similarities and differences. And as I tried to think of what, what was common to all these stories is that women were telling me it was difficult. So I chose the name difficult adult child to acknowledge not just the challenges faced by the grown children, but the hardships passed along to the mothers who cared for them. Initially, when I was picking this name, colleagues said to me, no, 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 you can't use the word difficult. You know, that's blaming the kid. Um, and at times when I write about my book, I hear from people who have mental illness that they don't like my using the term difficult. But I saw that the dictionary def definition of difficult, I thought really did capture what I was hearing. What the dictionary calls difficult is difficult is when something is hard to do or carry out. And I think being a mom of someone who has a mental health problem is hard to do. Difficult according to the dictionary is something that's hard to deal with, manage or overcome. And difficult is something that's hard to understand. And I think, and I list, as I listen to the other stories, this is what they were all telling me, that trying to be there, trying to protect, trying to see what they could do to help was hard to do. Tolerating the tensions in the relationship with their struggling adult child was extremely hard to manage. And understanding the problems that might have caused their child's situation were hard. So I came up with this name, Difficult Adult Child, and also Difficult Mothering. And I'm hoping that people who read my book and work with me may consider using this word. I think it's much less pejorative than having to say, my daughter is an addict, or my daughter is bipolar, my daughter is a drunk, my son is schizophrenic. 
that talks about both those are sort of blaming, you know, they're, it's like a, an item, my daughter is an addict and nobody likes to say it. So you just don't talk about it. You just sort of smile and say, no, she's okay. Um, but I think if we could begin to talk, use the word difficult adult child, we move, it becomes a relational thing. It's not just about what's wrong with your child. It becomes about your own situation, that you are faced with a difficult mothering situation. And the thing about things that are difficult is they can become easier. It is a problem that can be, can't be solved, but it can be ameliorated if you're willing to acknowledge that there's difficulties. Giving a name to a family problem is what I believe the first step in being able to take action. The problem with mental illness and drug addiction is there's so much stigma about it most, you don't want to tell anybody. Many people who I spoke to had cut off from their own families because they kept being blamed by brothers and sisters who said, you know, why are you enabling? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? But if we can name this as I have a difficult adult child, it's similar to when we named domestic violence. You know, it was only back in the 70s that we had the name domestic violence. And Having a name is really important. Like with domestic violence, right now, if a young woman is sitting in the car and her boyfriend is screaming at her, she can begin to remember that she heard on the radio something about domestic violence and say to herself, ooh, this is domestic violence. Maybe I could get some help for this. So I'm hoping that if people begin to use the word difficult adult child, that more people will feel freer to get help. I'm going to give you uh, one more woman's story, which is Faith. Um, I met Faith at a agency that gave legal help to seniors. She had come to find out how she could evict her daughter. Her daughter was 52 and her grandson were living with her. They were both diagnosed with bipolar. I interviewed her after she met with a lawyer. She said, I'm still trying to help them. But at the, they had been living with her for two years and they lived in a very small apartment. Um, and she found herself having to you know, be on eggshells, trying to keep the tension in the house. And she had just come from the doctor and the doctor said, your blood pressure is so high, you're at high risk for you know, really having a heart attack. You have to get rid of the stress. The stress was having these kids live in her house. So she said, you know, I'm at a crossroads. I have to, I can't keep on leaving myself out. I have to help myself, but I don't know what to do. I have to stand up to them. And at the same time, I have to understand that they have real problems and I wanna help them. I don't wanna give up on them. I, if I step back, something could happen to them and I'll be sorry that I did continue to try to keep working with them. When Faith left me, she didn't know what she was gonna do. And my sense was she was not going to evict these kids. And I did follow up with her by phone calls and she did not evict them. But after two years, they were able to move out on their own. But Faith was 80 years old. Is this really what she should be doing at 80? Um, according to most textbooks on typical adult development, faith should be in what's called the post-parental stage or the empty nest stage, which is assumed to occur when one's children are all out of the parental home. But all of the women who I met were not in an empty nest stage. Even if like Jillian, who I told you about, being a mother worrying was part of her ongoing issues. So everybody I talked to, and this is true for every parent, that sociologists call what happens in families is we have linked lives. When something happens to one's adult child, it affects us as a mother. You know, if you ever watch, you know, two 
middle-aged or older women meet each other if they haven't seen each other for a few days, what's the first thing they say? How are the kids? You know, this is for many older people, how your kids are is how you are. And so if your adult child is in trouble, it affects you as a mom. And that's when difficult mothering begins. So very few people have looked at the life stage of um, mothers with their adult kids. It's actually the longest time that we are a mother. We're only a mother of infants for nine months. We're mothers of toddlers for two years. We're mothers of teens for about five. But we're mothers of adult children, perhaps it could be for 70 years, people living to 90 years old. My close friend's mom is gonna be 108. So she is a daughter at 70. Um, so we have to begin to pay more attention to what this, how things change. And so I looked at Jillian's life as she had described it to me. She's the first person I told you about who felt like a mule on a harness. And I think this first stage in her mothering of her adult child was her daughter had just graduated college. She was living on her own and she got a phone call from, the mom got a phone call from a neighbor who said something's not right with her daughter. She's acting weird. So Jillian got a plane and went there and she could tell something was not right, brought her back to the family doctor and she had her first hospitalization. After she was stabilized on meds, the mom said, okay, we're gonna, this is gonna be a fresh start. And that's when she got her daughter her first apartment. They furnished it beautifully. And then, as I told you, this happened 21 more times. But each time for 20 years, she kept hoping that this one will be okay. And for a while it was. And then there was a third stage called, which I called crossing a line. And this was uh, when Jillian felt really betrayed by her daughter because she broke into a family cabin that they had on Lake Michigan where she was forbidden to go. The family already had a history of Celia breaking into their suburban home, but she had never broken into this cabin, which had a lot of personal history for the mom. And she flooded the place, she stole things. Um, and Jillian was just heartbroken. Um, she almost called the police. She almost cut her off. She didn't, but she did feel like something changed inside of her and they stopped getting new apartments for her. And they just, they did continue to pay for uh, housing for her so she could be in a motel, you know, but the mother did keep thinking that she was gonna find the perfect house for her. And then, you know, 30 years down the line, Jillian's getting older and her mom described herself as running out of gas, that she just did not have the emotional energy to keep being there for each crisis um, they continued to be there, but she just was not as invested. She also saw friends were dying. She and her husband, her husband was turning 80. She wanted to spend some time, more time focused on their relationship and just felt tired and wanting something to shift. And then the last stage, which I don't have on here, is... Um, I'm gonna stop this share because I don't think I have the right thing here. Um, one second, folks. We're, I'm just bringing up a different slide. Um, is this right? Let me see where we are. Okay, I'm just gonna tell you where I am. And, um, the last story was uh, After I'm Gone, the last stage in her life, where she started really worrying about who was going to take care of Celia after her death. So they had financial banks that were going to give the money, but they wanted a more hands-on um, person to be able to be there. And there's several other researchers who have found that mothers and fathers who have 
kids with mental illness are very worried about the next plan. Often siblings will be the next stage. So th the question is, my book is called Mothering Difficult Adult Children Through Conflict and Change. So what kind of change is possible? Um, what I suggest to people, and I have in here a um, depression scale that you take, because if you are really depressed, if this has really worn you down, um, you need to get help. There is help for depression, so that if you need your full energy to be able to continue to help yourself and help your child. And the kinds of changes that I offer in the book are that it's really important to get social support. Joining a group of the other parents is critical. Often, you know, as we get older, we don't have our work friends. We're not uh, have college friends. Our, our networks shift, sh shrink. So what's really important is even though you say, I don't want to talk to strangers about things that are so personal, the research shows that talking to strangers really helps and can be much more beneficial. You're, your brother and sister and neighbor are all sick and tired perhaps of hearing the story. And joining a NABI support group, uh, I don't know if the Bipolar Foundation has support groups. Um, so finding social support for yourself, self-care is really important, not meaning taking a bath, but really finding some time to read a book, to go for a walk. Uh, research shows that if you, uh, go for a walk with a friend, it lowers your depression. Um, that some way, just finding little spaces where you can amend and expand your own life. What I, I do not like the word enable. I don't think most mothers are ready to walk away from their kids. Some mothers have to. I have a whole chapter in the book about uh, protecting yourself from violence. Uh, elder abuse is real and it's often the perpetrator is an adult child who has mental illness or substance abuse or both. So you, you may have to evict your child, but that doesn't mean cutting off from them. It means helping them find housing. So there are lots of things to do. There are, I have in the book, a whole set of resources for how to uh, call for help if you're in danger and I would like to hear from you and I look forward to these questions right now. And uh, please stay in touch with me. We're gonna send you uh, my contact information. My um, webpage is difficultmothering.com. And I think Mika will send you everything that you need to know. Yes, thank you so much, Judith. That was such a wonderful presentation such moving and brilliant stories. And we're so glad that you could be here and share all this information with us. Um, we'll move on to the question and answer portion right now. So if you have any questions, make sure to leave them in the chat. I know a couple of you have, so thank you for those. And we'll start out um, um, with one question. Um, so Roxanne asked, um, when your adult, when her adult child is in recovery or remission, but still needs assistance and understand assistance, um, she was wondering if you have any knowledge about understanding this new role that she'll play in as a mom. Um, do you have any references for recovering a um, bipolar adult and mother child? Well, I think. One thing that's missing in a lot of our substance abuse care is it focuses solely on the patient. And I think that like in other countries in the United Kingdom, in Portugal, the federal government has started putting in a lot more money to work with the families. So I think you're talking about a gap that we really, you know, there's two people going through this recovery. Your daughter's in recovery, but you too need some help. So um, I can't give you specific things, but I think if you realize that she's not the only one who's trying to figure this out and uh, Al-Anon is a good resource, it's not perfect, but it's definitely a good place to begin and um, to maybe advocate for 
at her place to have a group for the moms. Awesome. So another question was, do you recommend that an adult child and parent should see the same therapist and connect on that matter? I think it completely depends on the therapist and if they're trained to work uh, as with families. So I think um, there are people who are trained as individual therapists and there are people who are trained to work with families. So I think it really, really depends. I can't okay. tell you one or the other. Yeah. So in your research, did you notice a difference between um, mothers and fathers, like behaviors and choices as it pertains to their family obligations? Well, I did not gather the data to make that comparison. I only spoke to moms. Okay. Um, so, but I know that the moms themselves and other studies have shown that the mothers, as Jillian, who I told you about, talked about that she felt her husband processed the problem differently. She saw herself as bleeding inside all the time. And she thought her husband could um, shake it off a little bit more, could even laugh with her daughter. So and uh, there's been some confirmation for that in other studies and that you know women experience guilt and self-blame in a different way than men do. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, another question was from Andra, and she said that she facilitates a naming support group. Um, so this is very familiar, but she was wondering if you could elaborate on self-care. We hear, we have families that have a loved one living with them and it can be hard to find um, that self-care. So any help would be incredible. I think learning how to set little boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, there's some wonderful, wonderful program in New York uh, run by Jassa Leap, um, which I can give you the reference for to put on the website. But the social workers there help, like one example she gave is like to say to a mom, set more boundaries. That's like too broad. But she would say to the mom, like if you're watching TV together and the son says, hand me the remote, you say, you get the remote. <laughs> You, you do little things. You do. Um, she helped one person who was not able to set boundaries with relatives who were always calling to have her set a timer. You know that the, these things are hard. We get into patterns with our kids. Uh, we're used to letting things go and finding a way to change it. And in the book, I use the stages of change model to ask you to really pinpoint what specifically is most uncomfortable because you're not gonna change things that other people think you should change. You're only gonna make changes where you yourself are ready to change. So if you're upset that every night you come home and your food that you plan to eat for yourself has been eaten, that's something you have to take charge of. You could put a lock on the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. you know, there's little things that you can do to make sure of the things that really get to you uh, become a little bit better. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's a great um, piece of advice. Another question um, from our audience um, was from Sabrina and she said, is there anything I can do to help my adult bipolar son who is self-medicating with alcohol and marijuana? He's medically compliant and presently living on his own, but still learning how to navigate this relationship. What I mean in terms of helping him to cut down on his? Yeah, or just um, if her son is living on his own um, and doing some better things um, as in taking his medication, what are some tools to still help him reach a healthier lifestyle? If I could tell you that, I'd be a rich person. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I don't have any magic things that you can say. I think uh, remaining supportive of the things that he's doing well. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have ideas, you know, I think sort of how we can help our adult kids is to gather information. And if they come to us and want that information, um, you find your moment when you can give advice. But I think keeping an open door, being loving, focusing on the strengths is the most that we can give our kids once they're adults. Yeah, that's a great answer. Thank you for that. 
Um, so another attendee asked, um, how many um, women that you were interviewed um, were, had a divorce kind of because of or relating to their adult children? Well, I was meeting people when they were already over 60. Mm -hmm. So many of the divorces or the deaths had occurred earlier, mm -hmm. um, but certainly there was tension. Um, I know one mom who had really a kid who was not that difficult, but she did have to come home as she was going back to graduate school and she was with a new partner and she forgot to ask the partner if it was okay for the daughter to move in. <laughs> and this created a lot of tension and eventually they broke up. Um, so it certainly is a problem, especially if it's a remarriage. There's a lot of issues there. And this is where couples, if you can afford couples counseling uh, to help you and your partner get on the same page with this. Wonderful. That kind of leads into my next question. Um, is how can husbands or other family members or other people in general um, help mothers balance the responsibilities and hardships of mothering a difficult child? Um, I think to listen and to not, I think the other point that I haven't had time in this presentation to talk about is the amount of self-blame that mothers carry with all this. Every single person I talked to in some way told me how they were to blame for their kids' problems. And so I think to be a supportive partner uh, helps not to blame the mom even more and to help her uh, realize that there's two people you know, beyond, there's three people in this, the partner and the mom and the kid, but it's not the mother's fault that the adult child has these problems. You might not have been a perfect mother. None of us are. You might have been a bad mother, but that does not make it okay for someone to be abusive to you, somebody be verbally abusive, um, that we are infallible. And even though our society expects mothers to be all knowing and all giving, it's not possible. And especially as we age, you know, we run out of gas. And I think the more a partner can be understanding and to help, mm -hmm. um, the better it can be. Definitely, that was a great answer. Thank you so much for that. Um, another question we had from the audience was, um, what can be done to help an adult child to realize that they have a problem with mental illness and get them to agree to treatment? This is a common question that comes up a lot. So it's a, I know it's a hard one, but any advice would be wonderful. Well, this is one of the dilemmas with mental illness because part of, I never can say the uh, word correctly, agnosi, do you know how to say it right? Ag there is a neurological term that has to do with um, that people who have severe mental illness are not aware that they have the illness. It's not that they're being stubborn. It's part of how the brain is. Like, I think we have more common things when people have certain kind of brain injuries. You don't know that your right arm has been amputated. It's similar with mental illness. So this is a big problem and it's we're trying to figure out, out our mental health system, just trying to figure this out. Um, there's issues about uh, human rights and the right for people. You know, we don't put people in long-term institutions anymore. Okay. Unfortunately, we haven't. And I talk a lot about in the book that this is not just a personal issue. This is a structural issue that we need an improved mental health system. We need better uh, substance abuse care. And families are being asked to take on tasks that they are not equipped to take on. You as a mom are not equipped or trained to be able to help your adult child with their mental illness. You need a team. Your adult child needs work. They need friends. We are asking families to do something that they cannot do. Mm -hmm. If you could build your dream um, revamp of structural care, um, what would you like to see in it to help mothers um, through their own process? 
Um, I think my little dream right now is I would like a place where mothers can more openly talk about their issues. I mean, that's why I'm suggesting the name Difficult Adult Child. Mm -hmm. um, I would like there to be support groups and community mental health clinics where moms could go to talk in a non-judgmental way and feel free to talk to other women, similar to the women's movement, when people felt free to start talking about, it was okay to say, I don't always love my husband or I don't always like sex, you know, where you could begin to talk freely about some of these issues. I think that we don't like to tell our friends or neighbors or even our partners how hard this is because mothers are not supposed to have mixed feelings. They're not supposed to feel resentful. And we need to be able to, you need to find some place where women can talk about this. And we need, I just found out that in Sweden, if you can freely, without any cost, join a support group if you have an adult child with mental illness, you can get psychoeducation counseling, you can get respite care, anyone who has a relative with a mental illness or other disability. Our society could be doing so much more for families and hopefully we will get there. And, um, and we need to be doing things, we need to be helping the people with mental illness to have more meaningful lives. Yeah, definitely. I think that we definitely need that incorporated and hopefully in the next coming years and with all the research you're doing, we can get closer to that place. Um, another question kind of on, um, as it pertains to mothers and the grander family scheme, um, how have you seen mothers balance care and attention for multiple children or um, adult children, siblings and grandchildren and balance the greater family with their adult children? And that's tough. Mm -hmm. And all the research shows that the child the adult child with the most need gets the most resources. Um, so the more healthy siblings resent it. Um, and there's actually been a study that's proven that the expression, you're only as happy as your least happy child, um, that having a child who's thriving does not offset mother's unhappiness about their child who's still struggling. And I don't know how we, get over that, um, but it's a very hard, and I know uh, there was an article about my work in the New York Times, and many people posted who are siblings that when their parents passed, they inherited uh, the problems that their parents had been shielding. Um, so this is, this is a sibling issue, this is a parent issue. We need to do better for people who have mental health issues and expecting that family can do all this is unfair. And I think um, becoming an advocate for the change in our mental health system. Um, one woman who's in my book, Leslie Carpenter, is a NAMI uh, graduate and advocate. And she has coped with her grief and, and is doing wonderful advocating for changing her mental health system in Iowa. And, I think this is a place to take your powerlessness and become powerful. Definitely. That's why IBPF is here. We're hoping to be a part of that structural change and are so glad to have everyone with us today to help us on that mission. Um, and just to let you know, everyone in the Q&A is really grateful um, for what you're sharing um, and just want to say thank you. So I'm echoing their um, comments. Okay, well, I hope people will stay in touch with me. And um, I'm on Facebook, Difficult Mothering. I'm on Twitter, Judith R. Smith, PhD. And my website will show you how to order the book. And if you like the book, please write a review on Amazon. And because I'm getting wonderful letters from parents who I think feel heard. I think that there's something about going into the inside of how mothers experience this that is needed, is important, and I'd love to be in contact with your people who are here today. Yes, definitely. We'll um, have the link to your book in the comments of um, this video as it's uploaded to YouTube, as well as um, on our website as well at www.ibpf.org. So you can check out Judith's book there. Mm -hmm. um, 
we have a time for a couple more questions. Let me pull up. Um, So if um, an adult children um, finds a spouse or romantic partner, how um, do you establish those guidelines or boundaries with those two people? You mean if you have two difficult people <laughs> instead of one? No, um, just like um, if the a difficult adult child um, finds a romantic partner, how um, can the mother establish a relationship um, maybe the spouse is, um, has mental health issues or doesn't, just um, a way to create those um, boundaries and guidelines. Um, again, if there are good things in that relationship, welcome it and nurture it. And it's similar with your own child. You have to you know, just be in touch with when you feel um, pushed around or not seen and figure out your moments of when it's best to speak. I mean, I think I have an example in the book of a young man who moved in with his one-year-old and his partner. And 11 years later, uh, they were there with eight kids and the mom was being really violated in many ways, but she kept wanting to see her kid as a good kid. And it took her a long time and the help of Jasalip to finally get him legally evicted. But I think we don't wanna see that our kids are making us uncomfortable. And um, especially if they're ill, you know, so he has a problem, he's ill. How can I, you know, call the police? Uh, but you are also a person. And um, there's an example in the book of somebody who eventually ended up calling the police really the air conditioning person called the police uh, who was fixing the air conditioning. And the person had a substance use and mental health problem was incarcerated. And in jail, he agreed to mental health care and through the courts, he got help. So even your worst case scenario that you have to send your kid to jail, you can stay, remain their advocate, help them if they choose to uh, get ask for mental health care, get a mental health lawyer, and maybe they will get mandated care. And so it's, the world doesn't end if you send your kid to jail. It's horrible our, that our system now leads parents with that choice to send your kids to jail rather than to get psychiatric help, but it could be a last ditch way of their getting help. Yeah, definitely. I think that should be, that piece of advice that you can still remain their advocate even if you have to make hard decisions is a wonderful um, piece. And I think a great place to leave off on. So I think that's all our time for today, but I just want to say thank you to everyone who joined us and um, was a part of this important conversation. I hope you really all enjoyed and um, a special and giant thank you to Judith for being here with us. Um, and making us all feel less alone in whatever you may be going through. Um, if our listeners would like more information, could you remind them one more time where they can find your book and get in touch with you? So it's uh, just go to my website, www.difficultmothering.com. If you just Google me, Judith R. Smith, um, difficult, you can get it on Amazon and I'm on Facebook, difficult, just keep difficult in your head and you, I come up as difficult. I'm not difficult, I'm easy to find, and I look forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you so much. And if you enjoyed our webinar today, make sure to get in touch with Judith, um, IBPF, and subscribe so you don't miss any in the future. We'll be having more birds-related webinars directly relating to mothers and caregivers. So make sure to um, keep in contact and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you all so much for being here with us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.